Uh, we're going to read Genesis 44, starting at page... Oh, it's on page 39. Uh, we'll read 44, 1 to 17. Genesis 44 on page 39. Joseph commanded his steward, fill the men's bags with as much food as they can carry and put each one's silver at the top of his bag. Put my cup, the silver one, at the top of the youngest one's bag, along with the silver for his grain. So he did as Joseph told him. At morning light, the men were sent off with their donkeys. They had not gone very far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Get up, pursue the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Isn't this the cup that my master drinks from and uses for divination? What you have done is wrong. When he overtook them, he said these words to them. They said to him, Why does my Lord say these things? Your servants could not possibly do such a thing. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found at the top of our bags. How could we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If it is found with one of us, your servants, he must die, and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. The steward replied, What you have said is right, but only the one who is found to have it will be my slave. The rest of you will be blameless. So each one quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. The steward searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each one loaded his donkey and returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers reached Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell to the ground before him. What is this you have done? Joseph said to them. Didn't you know that a man like me could uncover the truth by divination? What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. How can we plead? How can we justify ourselves? God has exposed your servant's iniquity. We are now my servant's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup was found. Then Joseph said, I swear that I will not do this. The man in whose possession the cup was found will be my slaves. The rest of you can go in peace to your father. This is the word of the Lord. Now cast your minds back over the story. Uh, Our main character has been cast out of home and he's struggling to survive. Uh, At times he's aided by the assistance of others on a quest to be reunited with his family. At the climax of the story, all parties are coming together. And one of those family members who had cast out our hero realizes that they'd made a terrible mistake. Our hero had been telling the truth. There is an acknowledgement that wrongs have been committed. And what I think would be one of the most memorable quotes of the story. On the back of the moving truck, Slinky Dog and the little dinosaur Rex, they turn to each other and say, what have we done? Now we have guilt. Now the hero of the story is of course none other than Woody the cowboy, And his family are the toys of Andy's room. Uh, By movie's end, there are signs of repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, as all the toys huddle around walkie-talkies, listening to what Christmas presents Andy and Molly are about to receive. Uh, On its own, it's a great movie. It's a great story. And I think possibly when Disney hit its peak. But it also has some incredible insights. Uh, and many parallels to the Joseph Judah narrative. Could there be forgiveness and reconciliation if Judah and his brothers hadn't confessed their guilt and responded rightly? Would there have been reconciliation and forgiveness if the toys hadn't realized that Woody was telling the truth and realized the error of their ways? Slinky and Rex, speaking on behalf of the group, asked the deep and existential question, What have we done? And they acknowledge that now we have guilt. Well, we've been building to the climax of not just the Judah and Joseph narrative, 
but also Genesis as a whole. What is going to happen? In more ways than one, these chapters signal the beginning of, or the prospect of new beginnings. New beginnings brought about when the brother's guilt is uncovered and they respond in a right way. Uh, the story invites the readers to ask the same question. When our guilt is uncovered and found out, how will we respond? Before we get stuck into these meaty chapters, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. Uh, they are laid bare before you. Uh, help us to be open to your word and receptive to your Spirit's prompting uh, that we may be more uh, made more like Christ in everything that we do and say. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, we saw the dysfunctional nature of Jacob's family and the severe mercy that Joseph showed his brothers, a test to see if they had changed from when he'd saw them last all those long years ago. Joseph is in a place of great authority over both Egypt and his family. The brothers were instructed that if they were to return, they must bring their youngest brother with them, Benjamin. They do this, and by the end of chapter 43, things seem to be looking good, don't they? They feast together, and much to the astonishment of the brothers, they've all been placed in age order. And so we pick up the story the next day. Verse 1, chapter 44. Joseph, Joseph commanded the steward, fill the men's bags with as much food as they can carry and put each one's silver at the top of his bag, Put my cup, the silver cup, at the top of the youngest one's bag, along with the silver for his grain. And he did so as, as Joseph commanded. At morning light, the men set out, only to be chased down a short time later by Joseph's steward, accusing them of stealing. And the brothers are startled and initially protest. How could you say such a thing? We even brought back the silver from last time. If you find it, the one in whose bag it is will die, and the rest of us will be your slaves. Now, the steward responds by saying, no, that's okay, only the guilty will be my slave. The rest will be blameless. Uh, you have an outline uh, in your bulletin. Now, we're at point number two, the trap is set and the trap is sprung. Verse 11, each of the brothers lowered their sack and one by one, starting with the eldest, they open it. You can just imagine the feeling. No, it's not in my sack. It's not in my sack. Each one going down the line and then the, the cup was found in the youngest with Benjamin, Jacob's favorite and only half brother to the rest of the boys. They returned to Joseph who is still in his house waiting for them to return. They fell to the ground before him. And Joseph asks, what is this you have done? How will the brothers respond? Now, for the astute reader of Genesis, this is not the first time this question has been asked. It's not the first time we've heard those words. It's actually a phrase that is repeated over and over and over again. Uh, each time when sin, iniquity and guilt is uncovered, there is an answer of self-justification and the result is fractured and broken relationships. Now we're going to quickly deep dive back into Genesis and trace these events and see how it heightens this moment between Joseph and the brothers and especially Joseph and Judah. Uh, hopefully you can see that. If not, that's all right. You've got your ver the uh, verse references in the bulletin. So the wrong response. So starting with all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, God confronts Eve after she's taken the fruit and Adam has sat silently next to her. Uh, verse 13, So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? Uh, it's the same phrase from chapter 44. 
The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She shifts the blame. Confronted with her sin, she points to someone else. Uh, Chapter 4, with Cain and Abel. Cain's just invited Abel for a nice stroll in the field, and he's murdered him. Uh, Coming back, verse 9, the Lord God said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Then the Lord said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. First, Cain tries to hide and deny And then in the end, protests. Chapter 12, Abram has just been given a promise by God that he is to be a father of all nations, that through him the world will be blessed, he will have offspring and and land. And yet as soon as famine strikes, he goes to Egypt. Uh, In Egypt, he says to his wife, Sarai, "You're, you're a stunner. So say that you're my sister, okay? If anyone asks, Pharaoh sees Sarah, Sarai. Uh, yes, she's beautiful in his eyes. Pharaoh takes her into his house. But verse 17, the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh sent, Abram, sent for Abram and said, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she was my, she's your sister? Now, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave his men orders about him and sent him away. Uh, Abram's response to being confronted by sin? Silence. Nothing. Chapter 20. Uh, This might sound familiar. Abraham and Sarah are traveling through the region of the Negev. Abraham looks at his beautiful wife and says, hey, if anyone asks, just say you're my sister. It didn't go well the first time. It doesn't go well the second time. Uh, Abimelech sees Sarah and uh, takes her as his own, thinking, well, she's available, I'll make her my wife. Abimelech is warned in a dream by God. Not to do this. Verse 9, Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, What have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you have brought such enormous guilt on me and my kingdom? Abraham replies, I thought there is absolutely no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. Uh, He shifts the blame to Abimelech and the people, but also to God. And then he tries to rationalize. Uh, Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And so he kind of plays the technicality card a little bit. Uh, If this is sounding a little bit repetitive, it's because it is. Uh, Isaac is in the land of the Philistines, He says to his beautiful wife, hey, you're beautiful. If anyone asks, you're my sister. (laughs) Again, this is with Abimelech. Abimelech sent for Isaac after seeing Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. And he says, so she really is your wife. How could you say she is my sister? Isaac answered him, because I thought I might die on account of her. Then Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people could have easily slept with your wife and would have brought guilt on us. There is fractured relationships time and time again. The sixth occurrence is with between Jacob and Laban. Jacob has been working with Laban uh, for seven years for the hand of Rachel. Now, Rachel has been given to Jacob as his wife, and yet on the wedding night, uh, or the wedding morning, sorry, verse 25, when morning came, instead of Rachel, there was Leah. Jacob says to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? How will Laban respond? He's obviously guilty. 
Well, it's not the custom in this place to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. Complete the week of wedding celebrations and we will give you the younger one in return for working yet another seven years. There is distrust between Laban and Jacob and so it's no surprise that when Jacob decides to leave, he does so without telling Laban. He flees. Now Laban chases him down and verse 25, when Laban overtook him uh, where he had pitched his tent, uh, Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you secretly flee from me? Deceive me and not tell me. How does Jacob respond? He says in verse 31, I was afraid for I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. In each case, when confronted with the question of what is this you have done, uh, the same Hebrew phrase, when their guilt is uncovered, each mitigated their part and responsibility. They deflect, they shift the blame, they try and provide a reason for their deception and sin. The serpent deceived me. Am I my brother's keeper? I was afraid I would be killed. Ah, it's not our custom to give the younger daughter first. I was afraid you would take your daughters, my wives and grandchildren by force. Now, this repetition sets the pattern for expectation for the readers. What is this you have done? Each had the opportunity to confess their guilt to repent and to start to repair the now fractured and damaged relationship. Instead, they choose self-justification, hoping to deflect the accusations. So come back to Genesis 44, and we find the brothers on their knees before Joseph. Would they likewise insist that they didn't take the cup, claim innocence, or blame someone else? Verse 16 What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied, how can we plead? How can we justify ourselves? God has exposed your servant's iniquity. We are now my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup was found. Oh, we've seen the wrong response when confronted with sin. And we've just seen the right response. Now, point four on your outlines there's no claiming of innocence, there's no blame shifting, no trying to rationalise or mitigate their actions. It's a sharp break from the pattern. Joseph's tests have uncovered their guilt and iniquity, but God's hand has been over the whole process. Judah speaks for the group as a whole. What can we say? How can we plead? How can we justify ourselves? With Judah as their voice, unlike those who have come before them, they don't dodge the question. And crucially, they acknowledge that it is God who has uncovered their guilt. Still unaware of Joseph's identity, they attribute this retribution to divine work. Uh, their confession, of course, isn't about the cup. Uh, they didn't steal it. But this event exposes their deeper iniquity. Remember the bigger context. The brothers are being confronted by their past and already we've seen hints of remorse and guilt. Uh, chapter 42 that we heard two weeks ago, Joseph was placing Simeon in prison. Uh, the brothers say to each other, obviously we're being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but we wouldn't listen. That is why this trouble has come upon us. And now have a listen for the wrong response. But Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to harm the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must account for his blood. Reuben deflects and mitigates his role. Now they travel home, they find the silver in their bag, their hearts sink. Trembling, they turn to one another and say, What is this God has done to us? Their iniquity that many years ago uh, is that they sold their younger brother into slavery for pieces of silver. 
And as one commentator notes, the silver just seems to stick to them. They can't get away from it. First in the feed bags, now in the cup. The silver is a constant reminder of how they profited off Joseph's sale. We've seen a wrong response, we've seen a right response, and now we see Joseph and his response to the brothers. Point five on your outlines, severe mercy and the surprising substitute. Joseph once again shows severe mercy. Instead of doing what Judah suggests, all becoming Joseph's slaves, Joseph says, no, that's okay, only the one in whose bag the silver was found. Now the brothers have a choice. Like with Joseph, do they effectively sell Benjamin off for silver, leave him in Egypt, or, as the steward said, will a blameless party, one who didn't have the silver cup, take his place and be a substitute? Judah, the one who has up until now shaken off all responsibility, even slept with his daughter-in-law Tamar, comes forward. He speaks with Joseph. And what is the longest speech in the book of Genesis? Uh, Actually, uh, he recounts to Joseph the pledge he made to Jacob. Now, let's pick it up in verse 32. Your servant became accountable to my father for the boy, saying, if I do not return to him, I will always bear the guilt for sinning against you, my father. Now please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. Let him go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father without the boy? I could not bear to see the grief that would overwhelm my father. At this point, Joseph is unable to control himself and to keep his composure. The guilt of the brothers has been uncovered. By their words and their actions, there is clear repentance. Only now can there be forgiveness and reconciliation, something that was severely lacking in each of the previous accounts in Genesis, uh, the accounts of sin and iniquity being confronted and uncovered. Joseph does forgive his brothers and and implores them to change how they feel about selling him into slavery. He says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here. Joseph can already see God's hand in all these events that have led up to this point. He says, God has sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Due to the brothers, and in particular Judah's response, forgiveness is offered and reconciliation can take place. Uh, It is really important, however, to note that that while forgiveness and reconciliation is occurring, Joseph is not dismissive of the wrongdoing that has happened. He still frames it as, you are the one who sold me into slavery. And so highlights their part and their transgression. Having said that, following their sincere and tested repentance, he no longer counts their wrongdoing against them. He sets to work rebuilding the fractured and dysfunctional family. At verse 12 of 45, he says, Look, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I am the one speaking to you. Tell my father all about my glory in Egypt and about all you have seen. And bring my father here quickly. And by the end of chapter 45, that's what we hear. The brothers tell their father, verse 26, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was stunned. But verse 28, then Israel said, enough, my my son Joseph is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. Joseph has tested the sincerity of the brothers' guilt, has seen their repentance, and so can forgive and reconcile with them. It is a stark difference to what we saw earlier with Eve and Cain, Abram, Laban and Jacob. 
Uh, This episode in Genesis 44 uh, highlights a model for Christian fellowship and life under God. Point seven, when confronted with sin and guilt, those who had come before downplayed it. They tried to shift the blame. They tried to rationalize their actions. I think we can be a bit quick to look at their lives and go, oh dear, they're at it again. And maybe we even laugh. (laughs) Good grief, how many times can you say about your wife that this is my sister and think you'll get away with it? But I think if we give the Spirit a chance to do His work, to convict us of our sin, we'll quickly realize that we're not too different. How many times have you been confronted by your sin or guilt and have been quick to downplay it? Oh, it's, it's only a small sin. Maybe rationalize what you've done. Well, everyone else is doing it. Shift the blame? Well, it wasn't my fault. He did it first. Maybe dismissing altogether. It doesn't matter if I don't follow Jesus completely, does it? Now, the Old Testament teaches through story. And this part of the Joseph Judah narrative should hit us right in the heart. And so often we try to self-justify our actions before others and before God. Now here we're provided with a model of how we should respond when we are confronted by our sin. Now so firstly, uh, exposing and confronting sin is a good thing. God does so explicitly in the garden and with Cain, and his hand is on all the other accounts. Now, throughout the whole Old Testament, the prophets are constantly confronting God's people with their idolatry and wandering hearts. Now, Proverbs 28:13 says, "Whoever conceals sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy." Jesus, throughout his ministry, was constantly confronting people with their sin, their idolatry, their greed, false religion, apathy. I love reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his work. Uh, He was a German theologian during um, Nazi-occupied World War II. Uh, in, in one of his books, uh, he writes these words about the pious church and about the sinful confessing church. He says these words, In confession, the breakthrough to community takes place. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him and the more deeply he becomes involved in it. The more disastrous is his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen even in the midst of a pious community. In confession... The light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusions of the heart. We need to be a people who confess. Confession should be a natural part of our fellowship with each other as we seek to build each other up in holiness. This should happen as we are meeting up one-on-one with each other and reading the Bible, praying, sharing our lives intimately. It should happen in Bible study groups and growth groups. It's not a a generic, how are you going? Oh, I've been struggling this week. No, it's specific. How have you been going this week? I've been really struggling. I've been really ungodly in my anger. A few times I've let it just fly off the handle. It needs to be one-on-one catching up with each other. How have you been going? I've been really struggling. 
I've been really struggling with lust. A number of times I looked at pornography this week. It needs to happen, Bible studies, one-on-ones, in our gathering. Ask each other, how are you going? Oh, I've been really struggling this week. I just see what that other person has and I'm just not content with what I've got. I see what they have and I'm jealous, I'm envious, I'm coveting their house, their car, maybe the family they have. Sin loves the dark and it hates being exposed. But it's in exposing sin that forgiveness, healing and reconciliation can take place. So second, the breaking, the break in the pattern of Genesis highlights the right response to exposing sin. And that's confession and repentance, which opens the way for reconciliation. Now, Genesis isn't uh, naive in optimism uh, that this will always end in reconciliation. And uh, we know that that's not always the case, especially between uh, individuals. But it does offer hope that forgiveness and reconciliation between people remains a genuine possibility when sin is dealt with. A third and last, it sets a pattern for how we relate to God. Left to our own sinful nature, we are condemned as guilty and cannot justify ourselves. We are the younger brother. We can't shift the blame. We can't downplay our sin or dismiss our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make Jesus out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Just as Judas steps in as a substitute for Benjamin, Jesus steps in into our place. But unlike Judah, who was clearly uh, held blame and guilty, Jesus is blameless, guilt-free, undeserving of any punishment. And yet he stands in our place. On the cross, he took our punishment, bearing the wrath of God, and so opens a way for us to be restored to a relationship with God. When we sin, Jesus now stands as an advocate before the Father, interceding on our behalf. John says in his epistle, Uh, And the words previously came from that. He says, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In order for new beginnings, forgiveness and reconciliation to occur, we need to be a people who don't dodge the question, what is this you have done? We need to be willing to confess our guilt and iniquity before each other and more importantly, before God. Fall before God as the brothers do before Joseph and say, how can we justify ourselves? God has exposed our iniquity. 